As climbing has progressed in popularity and difficulty, climbers have been able to pull off some incredible new moves that were once considered impossible. This inevitably means that our bodies and especially our fingers are being pushed to new limits. But pushing the boundaries doesn't come without a price. And lately, one of those prices has been the rise of an injury to a rather odd and even mysterious muscle. In this episode, we're taking an in-depth look at these weird muscles in our hands called lumbricals. We'll talk about the structure of lumbricals so you can understand why they're important and how they get injured, and we'll go over how to test for a lumbrical injury, as well as some general rehab advice. We'll also have a separate video with detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to recover from a lumbrical injury, so keep an eye out for that. Now let's get started with a little anatomy review of the lumbricals and what makes them so dang special. The lumbricals are quite unique for a variety of reasons. For one, they originate and insert in the hand, making them an intrinsic muscle. This is in contrast to an extrinsic muscle like the flexor digitorum profundus, which begins at the elbow and ends in the fingers. Secondly, they're not attached to any bones. They're actually only attached to tendons, specifically the flexor digitorum profundus in the palm and the extensor tendons in the fingers, which means their attachment points are completely mobile. They change position as the FDP and extensors move. Thirdly, and most important for understanding how they get injured, the lumbricals of the pinky and ring fingers have a bipennate structure, while the middle and index fingers are unipennate. A bipennate muscle is like a feather, like the barbs of a feather go in opposite direction on either side of a central quill. With a bipennate muscle, the quill is a tendon and the barbs are muscle fibers. So the fifth digit or the pinky finger has half the lumbrical muscle fibers from one side of the pinky and the other half from the ring finger. The ring finger has half on the ring finger side and half on the middle finger side. The middle and index though are unipennate in structure, meaning that the muscle fibers are all oriented in one direction as they originate at one tendon. The mobile attachment sites of the lumbricals made it hard to study their actual function, but researchers eventually settled on one main conclusion. The lumbricals primarily act in a sensory role, helping to maintain a healthy balance between the finger flexors and the extensors. More specifically, the lumbricals provide feedback on the force generated at the flexor digitorum profundus and the extensor tendons to make sure one doesn't really overpower the other and create an issue or injury. So what does this mean for climbers? Well, first, with anything in our bodies, there needs to be balance between the various parts for it to function healthily and to get us up the rock. Since climbing relies heavily on the finger flexors compared to the extensors, we need the lumbricals to make sure those tendons don't become too imbalanced as that could lead to malfunction. Additionally, there is evidence to show that the lumbricals provide information regarding the position of the DIP and PIP joint, particularly while the MCP joint is slightly flexed. This position is also where the lumbricals are most active in a mechanical role, rather than just a sensory one, meaning they also add in some, albeit small, mechanical stability to the joint. Therefore, we can conclude that the lumbricals are particularly important for the healthy function of our hands when on slopers and pinches. Now, you might be thinking, oh snap, I'm just gonna train the lumbricals for a month and I'll be climbing slopers and pinches like a beast. Not so fast. The lumbricals are actually weak AF. Research has shown they only contribute about 2% to the flexion strength of the MCP joint. Basically, the lumbricals are not going to directly help you grip really hard, rather the sensory feedback they provide allows other parts of your hand to do so without injuring themselves. So what happens to the function of your hand if you injure the lumbricals? Mainly, injured lumbricals will have a reduced ability to provide the needed sensory feedback in the hand, which means your body won't be able to maintain that all-important balance as effectively. This may prompt your body to limit force production in the hand for fear of injury, meaning you won't be able to hold on at your usual strength. Also, since the role is sensory, lumbricals help with dexterity, 
Losing dexterity may have a small impact on precision movements with climbing, as well as in your everyday activities. You know, the things you do when like, you don't get to climb. <laughs> Yeah, there are no things besides climbing. <laughs> yeah, I know, but for some people, there might be weirdos. Oh. Wow, I feel bad for them. Yeah. Now that we know how the limbricals work and what their function is for climbers, let's talk about how they get injured in the first place. So injuries to the pinky and ring finger limbricals are somewhat common due to their bipennate structure, like if you recall that feather example. An injury happens when one finger remains in an extended position while the adjacent fingers flex. As you can probably imagine, this can happen easily when climbing on pockets or if you just don't get all your fingers on that small hold. Let's use a two finger pocket as an example. Imagine that the ring and middle finger in the pocket and the index and pinky are not. Remember that the lumbricals attach to tendons. So in this position, the extended ring finger is pulling one side of the lumbrical in one direction, and if the adjacent finger is flex, it's pulling in the opposite direction. Think back to our feather example. Grab your imaginary feather from either side and pull in opposite directions. You're gonna shred your poor feather. Now, just flexing one or two fingers is not the issue. I mean, I can stand here and do this, with my hand all day pew, without damaging my lumbricals. The issue is applying a heavy force through the finger when they're in such differing positions. Because of this, it is actually safer for the lumbricals to try and leave as much of the finger not in the pocket extended if you can. But that's a topic for a whole other video. But what about the unipendent lumbricals of the index and middle fingers? These are much less likely to be injured because of that structural difference and have been shown in studies to actually be stronger than the bipennate lumbricals of the ring and pinky finger. So now we know how a lumbrical gets injured, but what does it actually feel like? How do you diagnose a lumbrical injury? The first step is determining if you have the right symptoms. A lumbrical injury will typically present with pain in the palm of the hand, up or near the base of a finger, and perhaps into the region near the A1 and or A2 pulley. For this reason, it is possible that it can feel like a pulley injury when it is not. The pain is typically not in the direct center of the finger or that finger's flexor tendons, but slightly to the side of the finger or tendon on the palm side. Symptoms are typically more of a dull ache, but can feel more like a sharp pain, particularly if the lumbrical is stressed. Which brings us to the next point, the lumbrical stress test. The lumbrical stress test is the main way to diagnose a lumbrical injury. To perform this test, extend your injured finger while slowly flexing the adjacent fingers. This can be done passively or actively. Actively means that you do it under your own volition. This activates the extensor tendons of one finger while actively flexing the adjacent. Passively would mean using the other hand, or a friend if you have one, to hold one finger in extension while flexing the others. I recommend actively first because you will naturally start to flex the injured finger which will help protect it a little bit, and if there's not a lot of pain then you can try the passive test. If the passive or active alone causes pain, do not continue. You can safely suspect a lumbrical injury at this point. If the first step does not cause pain though, and you have gone through the full range of motion, perform the following. So while in this position of being extended and flexed, gradually apply increasing pressure near the tip of the injured or extended finger, forcing it to engage in flexion. The injured finger should remain relatively extended while the adjacent fingers remain flexed. The degree of flexion of the adjacent fingers compared to the degree of extension of the injured finger will affect the amount of stress on the lumbrical. So this is your tool to determine the severity of the injury. However, do not apply more force than is needed to produce mild, if any, pain. There is no need to suffer and make your injury worse. If you have to apply significant pressure or take the finger through a large amount of flexion versus extension before having any discomfort, then you may have a simple low to moderate level strain and likely no tearing. 
If you're able to get in position without pain and were able to load the finger with mild to moderate force before eliciting pain, the injury may be more of a moderate strain or perhaps a low grade tear. If you felt pain simply like going into the flex first extended position, you may have a significant strain or maybe a mild to moderate tear. If you have significant pain and like loss of function, you may have a higher level injury that needs to be assessed immediately by a medical professional and you shouldn't really be watching this video. Note, the timeline of the injury may affect the testing results. If you injured it climbing and are doing these tests five minutes after, you may need to retest 10, 30, or even like 60 minutes later to get a full picture of the injury. If you're testing one to two weeks later, adrenaline and acute swelling may no longer be a factor and testing results should be more accurate. All right, now comes the tricky part. The potentially misleading factors to a lumbrical injury are numerous. Here are some comparisons to help you figure out if you have a lumbrical injury or something else. Diagnosing a lumbrical injury versus an inner palmar plate ligament injury. Location is your best friend here. An inner palmar plate injury will likely be much more localized to the space between your metacarpal joint and will likely not cause any pain in the palm of the hand and definitely not near the A2 pulley. Flexing one finger and extending the other while loading the finger will not provide as clear cut information with this injury, so rely more on location. Determining a lumbrical injury versus an interosseous muscle injury. This one's not too bad. There are dorsal and palmar interossei muscles in the hand. The dorsal interossei muscles are bipennate, so they can suffer a similar fate as the lumbricals, but to differentiate a lumbrical from a dorsal interossei injury, follow these steps. With your injured hand, extend all your fingers and try to separate them one from another, especially making your hand as wide as possible. Next, take your uninjured hand and now try and lightly force two fingers together at the same time. Don't push too hard because those interossei muscles are pretty weak. Resisting this squeeze would create pain with a dorsal interosseous injury, but not likely with a lumbrical injury. The palmar interossei are even easier to differentiate. They abduct the same digits or bring them towards the middle finger. They are also unipendent, so they're not as likely to suffer from a pocket injury and will not likely be positive with the flexion slash extension test. To further confirm, bring the fingers together and then try and forcefully separate them. Pain with this may indicate a palmar interossei injury, but would not likely cause pain with a lumbrical injury. Determining a lumbrical injury versus a pulley injury. So this one's actually a little easier too. Like an A2 pulley injury, say it's at your, your ring finger, if you're pulling with all four fingers and creating a little bit of pain, that shouldn't necessarily change if you just pulled in through one finger. Whereas with the lumbricals, you'd have more discomfort pulling here just with the isolated finger and you wouldn't have much or any pain pulling with all four fingers. Determining a lumbrical injury versus a flexor digitorum injury. A lumbrical injury will have the worst pain when the injured finger is extended and the other fingers are flexed, like we discussed. And once you place the adjacent fingers in extension as well, the pain should reduce or eliminate. If you have a flexor digitorum injury instead, you'll likely have pain in both positions. If you're still feeling unconfident in diagnosing this injury, please reach out to a skilled professional for further evaluation and diagnosis of your injury. Rehab for this injury can be a little tricky as there are many factors to consider. For that reason, we'll have an entire video dedicated to just that. But here's some general advice to get you started. Don't do any of these activities if they cause you more than like a two or three out of 10 on the pain scale. Range of motion. Your best bet for an initial injury is just to perform gentle active range of motion. This can be performed almost immediately or within the first few days of an injury. Pick three rows on the palm of your hand. You're gonna go at the base of the palm and the middle of the hand and towards the knuckles. Start with your fingers fully extended, then flex your fingers until the fingertips touch each of those rows extending in between. Though it may seem somewhat similar, this is not tendon gliding. It's just range of motion. You'll also want to focus on creating the L position with your hand as this will lightly activate the lumbricals. Perform as tolerable multiple times a day. Stretching. 
You want to perform light stretching of the lumbricals. This will include two different stretches. One stretch will be extending at the MCP while flexing at the PAP and DIP. This will be assisted by your uninjured hand. The second stretch will be to stretch the affected finger into extension while stretching the adjacent fingers into flexion. This will create more of an aggressive stretch though, so be conservative here. You can start these stretches immediately or within the first week of your injury, depending on the severity. Tissue mobilization. Any type of like self-massage here is great just to help stimulate the tissue. Use your hand with some lotion or a massage tool or simply stimulate the tissue for like five to 10 minutes as needed. You can start this immediately with a mild injury or once any swelling or pain decreases with a more significant injury. Now for retraining. A few tips on this would be to work on the iron claw technique to get those flexors and extensors activated while moving the lumbricals. For this, you're gonna wanna use a body marker, a highlighter, or even just a Sharpie. Squeeze tight, keeping your DIP and PIP flexed, then attempt to extend at the MCP. You can also do strength training techniques for the lumbricals, such as like L pinches, farmer pinch carries, or even just general climbing. However, you'll want to avoid climbing on pockets until your lumbricals are more healed. Retraining can begin once you can go through full range of motion, gentle stretching, and tissue mobilization without significant pain. The prognosis around lumbrical injuries is quite good. A simple low grade injury to your lumbricals can take as little as a few weeks to resolve or as a higher grade, like grade two or three strain, can take anywhere from about eight to 12 weeks to resolve. And that's it. I hope you found these little muscles to be as interesting as I did. The more we know, the better we can assess ourselves, our injuries, and our climbing capabilities. So until next time, train those brain cells to make you sound heckin' cool when talking about climbing with your friends at the crag. Climb those pinchy monsters and explain why you're doing it, how the lumbricals are the true heroes in this scenario. Send it using an unnecessary pocket just for show. Yeah, maybe don't repeat that last part. Not so fast. <laughs> Not so fast. You're gonna shred your poor feather. No, dude, that was my favorite feather, too. I know, and you just found it on your nice little nature hike with your friends uh, that you don't have. So. <laughs> still, still bitter about that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, an additional tool to help determine to de <sighs> Now comes the tricky part. The potentially misleading factors to a lumbical injury are numerous, and I don't like the way I'm saying it. <laughs> if you're still feeling unconfident in diagnosing this injury, please re out Re, re ouch? Please re ouch. I feel like this um, Kirkland sparkling water is helping me speak better. Really? We are accepting a Kirkland sponsorship. Dude, that would be epic. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> you need some bacon? Sure. You need some sandwich meat? Great. You need pants? You need pants? <laughs> awesome. Good thing, I'm pretty sure I just saw that Kirkland um, just subscribed to our channel, so. Yeah. You should too. <laughs> Dude, say something cool so they like the videos and subscribe for more awesome content. Um, like and subscribe for more super sweet vids, y'all. <sighs> so lame, dude. So lame. I thought it was pretty good.